allegiance. On this day, Wednesday, March 14th, 2012, at 4 p.m., the regularly scheduled board meeting of the Chicago Park District is being held in the eighth floor boardroom of the administration building at 541 North Fairbanks Court, Chicago, Illinois. Will the secretary take a roll call of the commissioners? Commissioner Shalaby? Here. Commissioner Koldyke? Commissioner Hanlon? Here. Commissioner Lavelle? Here. Commissioner Salgado? Here. Commissioner Armstrong? Here. President Robert? Here. Form is present. Let the record reflect that General Superintendent Michael Kelly and First Deputy General Counsel Timothy King are also in attendance. Uh, the meeting will please come to order. Uh, commissioners and members of the public, before we get started, I'd like to take uh, an item out of order. We have a presentation from the Art Institute of Chicago by Douglas Druick, President, and Eloise W. Martin, Director. Good afternoon. Um, I was named the new director of the Art Institute in August of this year, so this is my first opportunity to appear before you, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, though my I'm new to this role, I've been at the Art Institute for a number of years, having served for 26 years as curator of two of the curatorial departments prior to taking up this new role in August. Um, I would like, first of all, to recognize and thank the Chicago Park District for its support of the Art Institute. We're proud to be part of Chicago's civic life and the ecosystem of cultural institutions that make Chicago such a dynamic and vital city. I'd like to begin by offering just a bit of the museum's history. We were founded with the School of the Art Institute as the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts in 1879, just years after the Great Fire. The school and the museum were very much part of the energy of the reconstruction of the city during that period. Um, and both the arts education and the fine and applied arts were critical to the kind of Chicago that the city of Chicago wanted to become in the late 19th century that is progressive and educated, sophisticated. Chica civic and philanthropic leaders followed the model of other world cities such as London and Paris and worked to establish a central arts institution that would serve Chicagoans and visitors. In 1882, we changed our name from the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts to the Art Institute of Chicago and through the 1880s inhabited a series of rented buildings downtown. As arts education in the 19th century was based on studying and copying masterworks, as you can see the students doing here in the galleries early in the museum's history, the Art Institute's earliest collections included plaster casts of the art of classical antiquity, what was then understood to be the pinnacle of Western artistic expression. We had actually purchased real estate in the loop just as plans were getting underway for the World's Columbian Exposition down on the south side. Although the majority of the exposition took place in Hyde Park and Jackson Park, there was also a World's Fair presence downtown, where buildings were constructed to accommodate special congresses and conventions taking place against the backdrop of the World's Fair. Knowing that museums and this museum would eventually need more space, city officials and Art Institute trustees struck a deal for a building on Michigan Avenue at Adams Street. The museum would pay for the construction of a downtown building for use during the exposition and then become its occupant after the fair ended. And that original building pictured here under construction in 1892 is one of the eight buildings that we occupy today. Once the Art Institute moved into its new home, the museum began an ambitious campaign to fill its galleries with original works of art. The museum's leaders aspired to a grand collection and made their intentions evident to all by carving the names of great artists of the past, Praxiteles, Apelles, Cimabue, Giotto, and others, on the outside of the building, as you can see in the slide I'm showing right now. At that time, the museum was a hope chest waiting to be filled. Our patrons helped us fill it by donating works of art and purchasing works of art outright for the museum. 
What makes the Art Institute's early history unique, what cannot be said about other major American encyclopedic museums, is that the acquisition of historical works of art was accompanied by an equally aggressive acquisition of contemporary art at the hands of forward-looking Chicagoans. These men and women were deeply invested in the artistic avant-garde of the period, and they introduced Chicagoans to works unfamiliar to American audiences. Paintings by Georges Seurat on the left, Vincent van Gogh in the center, and Claude Monet. These collectors eventually gave their paintings to the Art Institute, and thus formed one of the finest collections of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings in the world today. These foundations laid by these individuals continue to make the Art Institute a truly unique hybrid museum. It is an encyclopedic institution that has also and always remained committed to the new and the modern. This was true 100 years ago, and it's just as true today. As a result, the Art Institute is now one of the world's leading encyclopedic art museums that also boasts one of the greatest modern and contemporary collections in the world. Our permanent collection of nearly 300,000 works of art, from architecture and design to African art, and from Greek and Roman art to contemporary photography, is the third largest museum collection in the country. From those modest days in rented buildings, we now occupy nearly one million square feet across eight buildings, making us physically the second largest museum in the United States. And we continue to acquire works of art, constantly shaping, refining, and adding to the collection. Beyond the display of our permanent collection, the museum offers more than 30 special exhibitions per year to our 1.4 million visitors. We also present a robust series of public programs. More than 1,200 events each year that include lectures, concerts, gallery tours, scholarly symposia, and family workshops. Moreover, we're very active with school groups, hosting approximately 85,000 students from Chicago and Illinois with our museum education program. The Art Institute is not only active in the presentation and interpretation of its collections and exhibitions, it is also a world leader in art historical research and conservation. We have a highly skilled team of conservation specialists and scientists who physically maintain our works of art as well as collaborate with curators on groundbreaking research using cutting edge technology. We also have our own publishing program as well as a department devoted fully to the digital presentation of the collection both online and with initiatives in the galleries themselves. In short, the museum is far more than paintings that hang on the wall or sculptures that stand in the galleries. It is a research institution with one of the best art and architecture libraries in the world. It is a physical and digital repository of art history, architectural history, and Chicago history. It's a laboratory, it's a classroom, it's a lecture hall, and a concert venue. Our exhibitions range widely every year and a brief snapshot of some recent exhibitions demonstrate the breadth and the depth of our program. We aim to serve Chicago by presenting works of art from the world's diverse cultures so that residents of the city are able to connect to their cultural heritage. Right now we have on view the visionary paintings of the Indian poet and Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore in the first exhibition at the Art Institute that was loaned directly by the government of India. Opening in May, Dawood Bay, Harlem, USA, will reunite a suite of 25 photographs celebrating the life of Harlem that the Chicago-based artist exhibited in his first solo exhibition at the Studio Museum in Harlem in 1979. The presentation of the complete vintage set of Harlem, USA, recently acquired by the Art Institute, will be complemented by works of art specifically selected by the artist from our permanent collection. We also aim to showcase Chicago's contributions to global creative expression, particularly in the areas of architecture and design for which the city is internationally renowned. In 2011, we featured the architectural genius of Bertrand Goldberg, whose iconic Marina City has indelibly marked Chicago's skyline and enhanced Chicago's reputation as the home of progressive architecture. This September, 
we'll be offering an innovative presentation of the creative process of award-winning Chicago architect Jeannie Gang and her studio. We also spend years preparing exhibitions that shape the history of art. Last summer's relevatory exhibition, Windows on the War, put on view Soviet propaganda posters created by a collaborative of artists and writers working for the Soviet Union's news agency during World War II. Many of these enormous handmade posters were unearthed from deep within the storage area within the museum's Department of Prints and Drawings, and the discovery spurred a major research initiative that culminated in this exhibition. This was the first time the posters had been on view in the United States since the 1940s, and the exhibition was accompanied by a definitive and scholarly award-winning publication. We're looking forward to an equally impactful exhibition that opens just two months away, Roy Lichtenstein, A Retrospective. This will be the largest exhibition ever devoted to the American pop artist with more than 160 paintings, sculptures, and rarely seen drawings and collages. It has been enormous international effort and will also be traveling to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., to the Tate Modern in London, our partner on this exhibition, and to the Pompidou Center in Paris, where it will close. We will open the 2013 exhibition year with Picasso and Chicago, a major presentation of more than 250 of the very finest examples of the Art Institute's extraordinary collection of paintings, sculptures, drawings, and prints by Picasso. The exhibition coincides with the centennial anniversary of the Armory Show, the first major exhibition of avant-garde European painting presented in the United States. The Art Institute was the only museum in the country to display this controversial and groundbreaking exhibition and thus earned a place in the history of modern art. Our vibrant and diverse exhibition program, like our permanent collection, is planned and designed to engage Chicagoans and reflect the mosaics of identities that form our city. Developing the collection and presenting such high quality exhibitions have always been a priority for the Art Institute even during these difficult economic times. Like all cultural institutions, the Art Institute has been deeply affected by the economic downturn. Our endowment, which we rely on to generate approximately one quarter of our annual operating budget, was down 23.8% at its lowest point. Our support from the Park District, which accounts for approximately 5% of our operating budget, was reduced. The recession was also felt in the revenue we depend on from admissions, membership, and fundraising. We've been through stringent cost-cutting measures at the museum, including two rounds of layoffs and salary freezes, but work to keep these e efforts as invisible as possible to our public. We did not lay off any curatorial staff, nor diminish in any way the exhibitions and programs that constitute the core mission of the Art Institute, presentation, interpretation, and education. Last year, we were able to reinstitute cost of living incre increases for our employees and lift the rotating gallery closures. But these do remain challenging times. We are dependent upon and very appreciative of the critical support that we receive from the Park District. Given the continuing financial difficulties with the economy, we are proceeding with capital projects with secured funding that will serve the museum long term, most notably the reorganization of the museum's interior spaces. For the past five years, we've been working on a series of reinstallations that better showcase the diversity of the museum's permanent collection and that tell a more comprehensive story of the interaction among world's cultures. These recent installations and reinstallations have included the Alsdorf galleries of Indian, Southeast Asian, Himalayan, and Islamic art, which you see picture, pictured here, and the Western Wing and Japanese art galleries. They have dramatically improved the public's access to our collections and the connections among them. More recently, we opened brand new galleries for um, African art and Indian art of the Americas, which you see here. 7,500 square feet of gallery space for more than 500 works of art. This year, we are working on an extensive renovation of McKinlock Court, which originally dates from the 1920s. By this fall, this space will become the Mary and Michael Jaharis galleries of Greek, Roman, and Byzantine art. 
It will feature both a generous presentation of our collection and a rare loan of Byzantine treasures from the British Museum, as well as state-of-the-art interpretive materials on iPads and in the galleries themselves. Less visibly, we are also engaged in a project to replace all of the fan units in the museum's HVAC, or heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. This is no small feat in a campus the size of the Art Institute. These improvements are critically important to maintaining the tight control on temperature and humidity that are essential to a museum's operation and to the ability of a museum to borrow works of art worldwide. Both of these projects have been supported by the State of Illinois grants for infrastructure. In its execution of capital improvement projects, the museum is committed to supplier diversity. Minority and women-owned businesses were contracted for 13 and 6% respectively of the $295 million budget for the design and the construction of the modern wing. Several years ago, senior management of the museum and the School of the Art Institute made this initi initiative a priority. And this has been going on for some time and it's now um, come to, uh, we are focusing on it um, and are moving forward with this very quickly. Our plan is not only to revisit benchmarks, but also to expand our pool of suppliers to include LGBT firms as well as minority and women owned businesses. I hope my remarks today have served as a general introduction to the Art Institute and its current operations. I would like to thank you very much for your support and for the opportunity to speak here today. As the new director of the museum, I'm very much looking forward to working together with you in the future. Thanks a lot. Douglas, on behalf of the commissioners, I want to thank you. It was a superb, comprehensive report. And, uh, you know, we all know that we live with a world class art institute and very much appreciate the fine work you do. Thank you for being thank here today. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay, now it's, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, welcome Commissioner B.J. Armstrong. Um, B.J. Was, uh, was nominated by uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, and just uh, confirmed today at City Council as our new commissioner. And uh, BJ, we want you to thank you for uh, for answering Mayor Emanuel's call to uh, civic service. And uh, you know, while I know that uh, that most everyone here is very familiar with your presence in Chicago, um, we feel extremely lucky to have you here. We understand the initiative, the slam dunk initiative, that you've agreed to uh, to take on and lead. And I'm wondering if you can just uh, you know, kind of tell us tell us your story and uh, welcome. Yes, uh, certainly a pleasure and an honor. Uh, when Mayor uh, Emanuel asked me to, uh, with the Slam Dunk Initiative, I was quite thrilled. Uh, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, and grew right up in the city of Detroit. And uh, certainly I'm a product of parks and know how important that is to kids and, and what it means uh, to today's youth as well as when I was growing up. So growing up in Detroit, I was... Uh, I was one of those kids that was always playing in the parks and playing basketball and, and really I grew up uh, utilizing you know public spaces and when the mayor asked me to do that it was certainly my pleasure I, um, uh, I thought it was my civic duty uh, to uh, since I live here in Chicago to help out and participate and be sure to take care of the city any way I can I've uh, certainly grown to love Chicago uh, since I came here in 1988, 1989 or so, and I certainly feel that this is home and certainly feel this is a place that I certainly cherish and has loved and uh, have really grown up here in the city of Chicago. So it was a, quite a pleasure. I look forward to it. I look forward to working uh, with everyone here in the city and really playing my part in initiative to here to beautifying and keeping our city certainly uh, one of the finest places, if not the finest place in the world to live. Thank you. Thank you, BJ. Uh, I'm sure I speak for all the commissioners when I welcome you. If you'd, anyone else would like to make a comment, we'd welcome it. Otherwise, BJ, I know that I can assure you none of the commissioners will hold it against you that we were not asked for our autographs when we went through our confirmation. <laughs> 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 <It's quite okay. laughs> um, so uh, we're going to move right into item number one, which is election of, uh, of an officer. I nominate BJ Armstrong to serve as vice president of the Board of Commissioners for a term of one year. Commissioner Armstrong will be uh, fulfilling the term of Bob Pickens. I happily second. 
All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? The ayes have it. Benjamin Armstrong is elected to serve as vice president for a term of one year. Congratulations. Congratulations. I uh, also, also hereby appoint uh, Vice President Armstrong to serve as chair on the Committee uh, on Administration and as a member on the Committee on Programs and Recreation, hereby fulfilling the term of Bob Pickens, pursuant to the Chicago Park District Code, Chapter 2, Section A, Subsection 10C. Um, item number two, approval of the minutes from the regular board meeting held on Wednesday, February 8th, uh, 2012. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, will Secretary take a roll call for the adoption of the matter? Commissioner Shalaby? Aye. Commissioner Hanlon? Aye. Commissioner Lavelle? Aye. Commissioner Salgado? Aye. Vice President Armstrong? Aye. President Robert? Aye. Motion carried and the minutes are adopted. Okay, we will now uh, hear a presentation in recognition of Harrison Park for winning the uh, 2011 Mayor's Cup Award for their excellence and participation in citywide sporting events from the manager of sports, Tim O'Connell. Uh, thank you, Commissioners, uh, Superintendent. I appreciate your time today. Uh, we're here to recognize our 2011 Mayor's Cup champion, which is Harrison Park. A little background on the Mayor's Cup, just so you know, it's a, it's a way of tracking the participation and advancement of our parks through a, a myriad of sports for teams and individuals. So there's 19 different sports through three different seasons. All parks are welcome to take a part in it. And uh, Harrison Park in 2011 amassed the most points for their participation mainly and also their advancement in the different sports that we had. Um, I want to recognize the folks that are here today. Um, our Chief Program Officer, Vaughn Bryant. The Region Manager for the Central Region, which Harrison Park is a part of, Art Richardson. We also have the Area Manager for Central Region, which is Elizabeth Garza. Who, uh, who helps make it possible for all the competitions that happen in that area. The park supervisor, Tony Gonzalez, had a previous engagement, so he wasn't able to be, to be here today. But the, uh, the two instructors that really work with these kids day in and day out, in the evenings and on the weekends, are both here. And I want to recognize Melissa Gonzalez. <laughs> and I also want to recognize uh, Moses Valentin. couple highlights of their season just to show you the diversity of the activities that the park participated in they uh, are the champions for girls 11 12 and 13 15 softball that's in the entire city their volleyball boys uh, 11 12 year old were the champions for the entire city and the 13 to 15 year olds were runner up citywide and then their girls 8 to 10 floor hockey champions for the entire city so they kind of do it all over at Harrison we see them quite a bit uh, they participate heavily and they do a great job I just want to recognize them we, we also brought the trophy that's a traveling trophy the Mayor's Cup was reinstated back in 2005, so we have that trophy to present. Uh, and again, just want to recognize and say what a great job Harrison Park has done. What's the address of Harrison Park? 1824. South what? It's, uh, the wood, you what? 18th and Damon. I just want to quickly thank um, Moses and Melissa for being here today. Uh, I, I, it, it's really a great. I, I was I've been here uh, since 2003, and I remember being very excited when we brought the Mayor's Cup back. Uh, I think back when I was a kid, I think it was the President's Cup. I remember actually talking about it as a kid. It, it, it's a great trophy. You, they get to display it right in the, in, in the field house. It's a great thing. Uh, it's something I know the mayor 
We've talked to the mayor about several times. He's excited about it. Uh, we're trying to get a sponsor, actually a national sponsor behind this cup. Uh, I think we might um, get something this year. So I just want to wish Harrison Park the best. I'm very proud of him. Uh, it, it's exactly what we are about at the Chicago Park District. So congratulations. Hey, Mike, can I say something, Mike? I think it's important for uh, folks to know I, I uh, worked in that community for 11 years, and I will tell you that that park um, and the leadership in that park is a great testament to how every inch and cranny of a park can and should be used. I mean, uh, go there at any time of the day, and you're going to see the leadership there making sure that kids are taking advantage of every bit of resource that the park district is making available to it. Um, and so congratulations to you, as I know you guys are making the most with what you have, and that's what we need to do today. Thanks. Uh, next we have a report on uh, minority business owned and women business owned compliance. Is uh, Rafi here? Um, so this is something that we're going to do on a quarterly basis. Um, you know, I, just, just a quick story. Uh, my, my first meeting here before we started, um, we we're, were presenting stuff, and Bob Pickens uh, came in and looked at, uh, at the minority business uh, report and the women business report and, uh, and said, this just isn't good enough. You've got to go back and, and get it right. And that was about two years ago. And in that two years that I've been here, this is something that's taken extremely seriously. But, but I, the board thinks that we ought to see this on a quarterly basis. And uh, if the format isn't quite what we all want to see, please feel free to make suggestions on how would you like this presented in the future? But we, we're going to see this information on a quarterly basis. Rafi? Okay. Uh, President Traubert, Commissioners, General Superintendent and CEO Kelly, my name is Rafi Serafi and I'm the Director of Purchasing. Uh, the report I'm going to present uh, tracks MBE and WBE participation on active contracts from the start date of the initial term through the end of the first quarter, 2012. Also, the contracts monitored are those within the responsibilities of the, of the Department of Purchasing pursuant to Chapter 11 of the Code of the Chicago Park District. Accordingly, this report does not include contracts such as legal services and financial services. Additionally, the Public Building Commission, or the PBC, is bidding and building projects for the Chicago Park District, and the PBC is responsible for tracking MBE, WBE participation on those projects. These pro PBC projects are also not included in this report. The dollar amounts of the participation that I will be reporting to you uh, re regarding the MBE and WBE participation are verified by either one, canceled checks from the general contractor to the MBE or WBE, or waivers of lien from the MBE, from the MBE or WBE to the general contractor confirming payment. When we do, this report will also include what does not show up in this report in the numbers, but, but what's behind the numbers is also our follow-up efforts with general contractors when we notice there are shortfalls. And we go through a lot of efforts to make sure that our, our GCs are meeting their commitments and their responsibilities. And some of the methods we use to make sure that they're complying with their commitments, the most effective is uh, withholding payment. And then, and then if things don't progress from there, we can also default terminate the contract immediately and even go into debarment proceedings. And so all those efforts that we do are behind these numbers and they don't, sh they don't show up. With that said, uh, we track construction and non-construction contracts. Overall on construction contracts, our MBE participation is 27%. The value of that participation is about $10 million. On WBE participation right now, overall on construction, we're at 8% and the value is about $3 million. Of, the, of all our construction contracts, we have 47 GCs, and 15 or 32% of those GCs are MBEs or WBEs. It, next, the, in the construction, we have a rapid response pool. In that pool, MBE participation is 22%, or about $925,000. WBE participation is 11%, or, or about $463,000. There have been about 117 work orders since this pool was established. Of the 18 GCs in the pool, seven or about 39% are MBE or WBE GCs. Uh, we did recently establish a general contractor pool in the construction uh, realm. However, uh, we, we just now brought a, a contract from that pool to the board, so we don't have uh, you know, numbers to report yet. The, the pool is still, still fresh. In that pool, 18 GCs, 5 or 27% are MBE or WBE. 
standalone construction contracts. Uh, we have 11 contracts. Uh, the MPE participation on those is 11 is 27 percent, excuse me, for about 9.1 million dollars. WBE participation is 8 percent, or about 2.5 million dollars. And of the 11 GCs on our construction construction term contracts, three or 27 percent are MPE or WBE. Non-construction. Overall, MPE participation is 29 percent. The value of that participation represents about 40 million dollars. WBE participation is 13%. The value of that participation is roughly $18 million. In, uh, and we have in the uh, non-construction realm, we have 199 GCs, and of them, 82 or 41% are MBE or WBE. We have a, uh, a uh, janitorial supplies target market contract, and there we have 100% participation because that's a target market contract. And the value of the participation to date on that is $727,000. Similarly, we have a janitorial services uh, pool, and that's a target market pool. And the firms in those pools are either MBEs or WBEs, so we have 100% participation. And to date, we've issued four work orders in that pool uh, to the value of about $690,000. We also have a target market pool for outside printing services. And there have been uh, two work orders to date. Uh, they have, we haven't made any payments yet, so we haven't measured anything yet. We measure once a payment is submitted by the GC to the Park District. Our, uh, we have a design and engineering pool, and that recently, was recently established at the, at the January meeting, so we, we're just now getting firms online. But once all, but once all firms are online, there'll be 111 uh, uh, firms in the pool, 43 will be MBE or WBE, or about 39% of the firms in that pool will be MBE or WBE. We have a pool in non-construction world for uh, for printing of banners and large and large prints prints and large signs. That is, uh, right now uh, our MBE participation there is 31% or about $26,000. WBE participation there is 52% or about $43,000. Uh, then that represents about 28 work orders. Out of that pool, there are nine GCs. Three or 33% are MBE or WBE. The commodity contracts. Uh, we have 13 contracts on the commodity side. 27 GCs, 10 or 37 percent are MBE or WBE. We, our participation there is 22 percent or 2.1 million dollars on MBE. WBE is 14 percent or about 1.3 million dollars. Services, non-construction services such as landscaping, collection of hazardous material, uh, nature area services, etc. Uh, MPE participation is about 28%, which represents about $4.7 million. WBE participation is 7%, or about $1.2 million. $1.2 million. There are 30. That represents participation over 32 contracts. Uh, there are 21 GCs on the services side, and seven or 33 or 33% of them are MBE or WBE. And last but not least, on the non-construction side, management services. And by that, I mean uh, harbor management, soldier field management, golf course management, concession management, et cetera. There, the MBE participation is 29% or about $33 million. WBE participation is 13% or about $14 million. That represents participation over eight contracts. And all the GCs in that pool are not MBE or WBE. That, in a nutshell, is a summary of, of uh, our uh, report through the first quarter of 2012. Uh, are there any questions? So how do you think we're doing? Overall, we're doing well. Absolutely. We're, we, we're on both construction and non-construction. We're at 25. We're, we're at or above, just above 25 and 5. And the numbers I presented, as I said, are verified by canceled checks, waivers of lien. So uh, I, feel, I feel good about the numbers where we are to date. And if, if, and this is, I guess, not your area, but if I was curious as to how we do, and then the contracts may not be large, but with the professions, when we sub out legal work or accounting work, um, where, where would we see those numbers? Uh, we, we would have to go back and work with the law department and also uh, the, the CFO to get that information, and then we could, you know, report back to you on the participation on, on those contracts. Okay, but I think right. that's an important area to look at because I do think that uh, while it's difficult in areas like uh, the kind of large-scale construction contracting we do, there are lots of qualified uh, MBE and WBE firms that offer professional services 
and we do a lot of business. So mm-hmm. I don't know uh, the mechanism by which you would do it, but I'd like to see a concerted effort to reach out to women and minority vendors in that area as well. Sure, and we could report back to you maybe with the next report mm-hmm. uh, that uh, the next, end of the next quarter. That. Sure. And for those of us who uh, are visual processors, if you could uh, give us. Uh, <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thanks. Did you memorize all those numbers? <laughs> Just, uh, w- one question, Rafi. How does our performance, uh, if you will, relate to other units of government? Uh, so, I I could get that information for you. Um, I do know uh, you know our numbers are solid relative to how we're verifying them, uh, but I can certainly get you that information where how we are relative to the city or the PVC or CHA CTA. Because w- one of the issues you know when you're dealing with MBEWE is the 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 goal of 25 percent is five percent is the floor, right? Um, it's not meant necessary to be the floor and the ceiling. Correct. Um, and and you know, so I I'd like to see us you know, consider it as just the floor, and and then look at right. ways in which um, we can set for ourselves, uh, given qualifications of firms, what, what what a good ceiling could be, and absolutely. see how that benchmarks with other a- units. Absolutely. And and then uh, keep in mind, with relative to the city at least, the city's at 16.9 and four and a half on their participation, MB and WB respectively. We're at 25 and five. Mm-hmm. Oh, you well. know what. I, I I would like to have a, a perspective. The way you've got it broken out here is mm-hmm. by category, so mm-hmm. it's um, percentage by category. But I think what I would like to have a perspective on is the overall spend, the percentage with respect to the overall spend for the park district, because I know that some categories uh, have much larger impact than others in terms mm-hmm. of how that works. So if there could be a summary with respect to the overall spend. And the other thing is, I look at this as a benchmark uh, in terms of the reports. So I'd like to have a sense of how that's trending from quarter to quarter when you report back. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Rafi, also, can you tell us uh, ways of ensuring that once they come into compliance that they're, they're, they're real, they're not just there in name only or, or as, a figure, as a figurehead? Uh, if I understand your question, uh, are you uh, regarding the uh, certification of the? Yes. Oh, yeah. We're not a certifying agency. Uh, we we accept the certification from the city, other other agencies, the state, and and the MBWB assist agencies. So when if we do learn of a, a certification issue, we go back to that certifying agency to alert them of the uh, uh, of the problem that that fell on our laps. Uh, if there I- and the remedies we have available are uh, debarment, termination for convenience, default, etc., and then we will pursue them working in concert with our law department when we do see a problem. But the the key thing too is to alert the re- the certifying agency that they have a, a potential issue as well. Okay, Ravi, thanks. I, this is a you know this is a, a I think a great first effort at mm-hmm. this, and uh, you know you got some good feedback, and I hope prior then to your next presentation, just check in with. Uh, commissioners and make sure that, that uh, we're getting um, what everyone likes. Absolutely. Um, uh, next, our director of purchasing will address an item that came up in the morning meetings regarding Bloomingdale Trail and the procurement process of the architecture and engineering services. Uh, Rafi Serafian again, uh, good afternoon. Uh, just, I would just like to speak briefly to the procurement process relative to the architecture services for Bloomingdale Trail. Uh, in summary, it followed state law every step of the way. In 2007, uh, the Local Government Professional Services Selection Act of the Illinois statute was amended to provide that park districts may not see cost estimates or proposals in terms of dollars, hours required, percentage of construction cost, or any other measure of compensation when evaluating proposals from architects, engineers, or surveyors. The act, as amended, laid out a multi-step process as to how we're going, how would we, how we procure those services. Step one is to evaluate, solicit, as we did uh, for our design and engineering pool through a publicly advertised RFQ, and evaluate those qualifications uh, from interested firms, which we did do. And we, during that evaluation stage, we cannot, we cannot consider in any way, shape, or form cost or anything considering uh, anything attached to cost, and we did not. Once the pool is established, then 
when we have a particular when we have a particular project we cannot send an RFP or an IFP out to the firms in the pool what we have to do is rank firms for the particular project from highest to lowest at a minimum state act requires that we rank at least three the firm that ranks which we did do for the Bloomingdale project and the firm that ranks the highest is the firm that we can approach for negotiations and it's at that point that we can begin to start the conversation on cost which we did do and and if negotiations with the highest ranking firm do not materialize and if we don't have a meeting of the minds at that point then we move on to the second ranked firm and that's the process in a nutshell pursuant to state law as amended 2007 and we followed that that process every step of the way so in these instances when for example you move from the first to the second you can't go back to the first any, no, any longer. We, we cannot leverage one against two, two against one. We're, we're locked into a conversation with each firm w once we're at that point. So if we're in a conversation with firm one and, and, and negotiations don't materialize, we have to close the door and move on. Now, we could mention to them, you know, if we can't come to a meeting of the minds, we're going to move forward and go to the next firm. Maybe that would produce some sort of movement on part of firm one. But if it doesn't, then we go to firm two, and then that's it. We can't then go back with firm two's price to firm one and, and leverage that. State law doesn't allow it. And firm two is not given the number that was from firm one. No, we can we can ask them if can they, if we don't like the price, regardless of whom we're speaking with, one, two, or three, we can ask we can inquire can they perform at a better price? It doesn't meet our budget, but to take the price from one to the next, we can't. Okay. Okay. I certainly would encourage everyone to stay, but at this time the board of commissioners will go into executive session to consider various matters which are pursuant to the Illinois Open Meetings Act appropriately discussed in executive session. There will be discussion of a waiver and release settlement agreement. So moved. Second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. The meeting is now in executive session. return to open session. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Return to open session. Okay. Could we just get Superintendent Kelly to join us here? Okay, if we have everyone's attention, please. Uh, the Board of Commissioners has met in executive session to discuss a waiver and release settlement agreement and had the following matter of new business. The Board of Commissioners approved the waiver and release settlement agreement with regard to the existing C3 Lollapalooza Festival Agreement. In addition, the Board has granted the General Superintendent and or his designee the authorization necessary to enter into a revised and amended agreement with C3 to conduct the annual Lollapalooza Festival. Um, now, I just want to make some comments uh, by way of explanation. Um, executive session was required so that we could preemptively settle all potential matters of dispute, including authorization of waiver and release uh, from the Parkways Foundation from a uh, three-party agreement. And and, and this, is, this is a big deal, and I'd like to explain to you what, what's going on here. We've pursued this um, with the following goals in mind. Um, number one, uh, we wanted to resolve the city, county, and state tax situation. 
um, resulting in a better deal uh, for the taxpayer. Number two, we wanted to achieve a straightforward two-party permitting agreement between the Chicago Park District and C3. Number three, we wanted to keep the Chicago Park District whole or better over the course of the agreement with C3, and that is uh, keep us in uh, whole or better financially, and also regarding the issue of landscape repair. And uh, number four, and, and very important, this is a wonderful festival, and we wanted to keep it in Chicago. This has enormous economic benefit and public relations benefit uh, to the city of Chicago. It's a great, great festival, and the last thing uh, we wanted was, was to lose something that's become so important to Chicago, both economically and culturally. Um, so the only thing we didn't do is, uh, is provide uh, our typical advance notice, um, which legally we really couldn't do until we had this release. So um, in the interest of openness, I'd like uh, read into record um, what, uh, what, we've, what we've done in executive session. And I'd like it read into record just as if it was an ordinary open board letter. Thank you, President Traubert. Uh Commissioner Superintendent Kelly, Timothy King, First Deputy General Counsel. Um, since October of 2006, when the first three-party agreement with C3 Productions was finalized with the Chicago Park District and the Parkways Foundation, the Lollapalooza Music Festival has been a successful public-private partnership that has generated more than $11 million for CPD capital projects. Essentially, a three-day permit agreement, this model has been utilized by other cities nationally across the nation for music festivals such as Austin City Limits, Pitchfork, and the Milwaukee Summerfest. In 2008, the Chicago Park District Board authorized the administration to enter into a revised agreement, and in 2010, the administration entered into a First Amendment amended agreement that expanded attendance and clarified landscaping restoration responsibility. In recent months, the tax-exempt status of the event has been challenged, which necess necessitated the revision of the existing agreement to account for the tax liability that the C3 Music Festival was to shoulder. And as a result of the change in tax-exempt status, the Parkways Foundation, as the 501C3 arm of the CPD, no longer desires nor is required to be a part of the arrangement. The revised arrangement between C3 and CPD, necessitated by the change in tax-exempt status, represents months of often difficult and contentious negotiations between the principals. And we are proud to say that the result is a better deal for the Park District and the taxpayer. The Chicago taxpayer obtains a sizable source of tax revenue in year one, approximately $1.4 million with captured amusement tax. The county and state also receive taxes that total over three hundred k. And the Chicago Park District, over the term of the renegotiated deal, is in a better financial position than it would have been under the existing agreement by gaining an increased revenue percentage over its term. In the revised agreement, the guaranteed minimum payment to the Chicago Park District for the event has been increased from $1.15 million in 2012 to $1.5 million for the, life, for the entire life of the agreement. The percentage that the CPD receives in net ticket revenues increases from 10.25 over the life of the entire agreement to 11% in 2012, escalating over the term to 15% by year 10. Three years have been added to the length of the agreement to extend it until 2021. But most importantly, C3 has agreed that it will not seek tax-exempt status for the term of the agreement, a significant windfall to Chicago taxpayers, which, based on 2011 sales performance, could be almost $2 million. And responsibility for landscape restoration at the entire site will still lie with C3. An independent CPA firm will be hired to conduct the annual audit. With that being said, uh, we have, uh, I'm pleased to have a princi the principal of C3, uh, somebody who's been very difficult to negotiate with, but um, he's, a, he's a great partner for Chicago, Charlie Jones. Uh, Commissioner, Superintendent, thanks for uh, having us here today. Um, what I wanted to say, because uh, a lot of you haven't been here since the beginning, uh, is basically the uh, the current operating structure in which we operate Lollapalooza in with 
the Parkways Foundation as the tax exempt status. It was created over eight years ago in this room um, as a call from the Chicago Park District to create additional revenues via a fundraising event for programs that were cut throughout the Park District. And C3 Presents stood here at this podium, uh, presented a concept of a multi-day, multi-stage experience-based music festival that could raise those funds and were prepared to guarantee them in year one. Um, that is the start of uh, how we, our negotiations began. And ultimately, Lollapalooza was created to satisfy the fundraising needs of the Chicago Park District via its nonprofit arm, Parkways. Um, since that time, it's obvious that Lollapalooza has grown in scale on in many levels. Um, and over the past six months, through these negotiations that we are speaking of um, with uh, the superintendent and Tim King, uh, we recognize that the needs of the city have changed and the, uh, the goals originally set for parkways and the fundraising needs have, have been met and then it was time to look at a more sustainable uh, a more sustainable contract that could assure the fundraising efforts for the Chicago Park District better serve the taxpayers of Chicago and keep Lollapalooza around for a long time. And so I'm thankful that we've come to this new agreement and we look forward to being here for many, many years. If I may offer the first comments, I do want to thank you for the consideration you gave. I, I, I've been here since the beginning when uh, Charlie and a group of people from Texas came in and sat at that podium and gave a, gave a presentation to us. And originally we were going to Washington Park, remember? We, we were looking at Washington Park and it was an idea and um, we didn't know if it would make any money. In fact, I think you guys lost money the, the first year. The people like Noren Ungaretti, the people at Parkways who were involved were tremendous then. They're tremendous now. It's been a long time partner at Parkways and I want to thank them for their involvement as well. What Charlie said is exactly right. Uh, Lollapalooza, Lollapalooza has grown by leaps and bounds to be one of the most successful, no, the most successful multi-day festival in North America, right? Wouldn't you say? Most successful is the right word, but it is arguably the biggest urban music festival in America. I'll say successful. I think it's successful. I'm proud to stand tall on this, on this deal. It's a great deal, not only for the Chicago Park District, it is a great deal for the taxpayers of Illinois and for the citizens of Chicago. Um, and I, I think that's, that's enough for me. You should know that in these negotiations that uh, your superintendent and general counsel have secured the Chicago, Chicago Park District with quite possibly the most expensive and lucrative music festival deal in America, if not the world. Well, we thank you for your partnership. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I will say, board, and, and to the public as well, over the years, uh, serving as first as the uh, first deputy general counsel here and then as the COO, I took calls from Boston, Denver, New York, San Francisco, um, I think Bakersfield, over the year asking us specifically, how did you do it? Um, you compare this to any of the other large music festivals, and this deal not only stands on its own, it's e extremely more lucrative than any of the other deals in uh, Bonnaroo's in, in the Milwaukee Summerfest. So again, I'm proud of that and I appreciate your uh, cooperation in those negotiations. Uh, commissioners, we have uh, further comment from the commissioners? I, w I would just like to, um, to uh, compliment uh, Mike and his team um, uh, on how hard you worked and, and the results. Um, that you appear to have gotten is a very, very strong work, and and we appreciate uh, your efforts very much. Again, you know, in the interest of of, of openness in a public meeting, um, we would like to invite any public comment. Again, limited to two minutes, but we'd like to invite any public comment regarding this issue. We will get to the people in the parks public comment later, but any public comment, uh, we invite you to the podium um, uh, to comment if there is any public comment on this issue. Well, people are running up to the podium. I also would like to thank, besides Tim King, uh, Steve Hughes, our CFO, and Tanya Anthony, our Chief Administrative Officer, for their help as well. If there are no comments, then we'll take a roll call vote. Did we want to hear from Parkways? 
Jay, would you Jay, like would to like say to a few you? words? I would just say on behalf of the uh, Board of Parkways Foundation, we're glad that this has been resolved in a manner that's beneficial to all the taxpayers of Chicago. Uh, we're very proud of all the work we did in fundraising during the period in which we received Lollapalooza funds, and we look forward to future work. And uh, again, we're just glad that this has been resolved uh, to the city's benefit. Thank you. And Jay, you'll pass on our, uh, our, our sincere congratulations and thank yous also to your board chair, Diane Springer. Uh, is there a motion to approve the matter? So moved. Second. Second. Oh, will the secretary take a roll call vote for the adoption of the matter? Yes, sir. Commissioner Shalaby? Aye. Commissioner Hanlon? Aye. Commissioner Laval? Aye. Commissioner Salgado? Aye. Vice President Armstrong? Aye. President Robert? Aye. Motion carried and the matter is adopted. Uh, next on the agenda is people in the parks. Will the secretary please call the names of those who have signed up to speak? Once again, we ask that you please limit your comments to two minutes. Our first three speakers are Andrew Vasilinovich, Tony Iniquis, and Bill Barnes. Shall I start? Hello, my name is Andrew Vasilinovich. Uh, you heard, some of you commissioners heard earlier today uh, from my boss, Carol Ross Barney, who is the founding principal at Ross Barney Architects. And as you may know, uh, we're part of the team that is just finishing the framework plan for the Bloomingdale Trail. The reason we came this morning was to speak in opposition to uh, hiring a new team to continue the design of the Bloomingdale Trail and to advocate for the continuing use of the services of the team that produced the framework plan. The argument uh, is that there's a very short period of time during which the design must be completed. The team that's been currently working on it has that knowledge and is ready to continue. By selecting a new team, you're hamstringing them. There's the possibility that the new team will not be able to finish on time, or if they do finish on time, that they'll have to do so without the knowledge that isn't able to be written down on paper, the knowledge that resides in our experience and in our minds. So you have the con I, I believe you have the written comments from Carol Ross Barney in your package. And I appreciate the earlier uh, discussion about the process of selection of the new team. And it, it, it seems a little bit like, I, I'm not an expert in, in park district procedures, but it seems a little bit like the tail wagging the dog. This is going to be a spectacular park. 30 seconds remaining. Thank you very much. Uh, this is going to be a spectacular park. And if you wanted uh, a new team, you should have opened up the process to a, a broad range of people and gotten people from all over the world interested in it. If you wanted a quick response, you should have retained us. We were not invited to respond or even uh, told who was going to be solicited. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Nikwis? Okay. Moving on, um, Mr. Bill Barnes? Would that be Mr. Donahue? Yeah. Mr. Donahue? Oh. Uh, Superintendent Kelly, President Robert, Commissioners, uh, I'm Bill Donahue, the President of the Advisory Council for Clark Park. I'm going to read a brief statement. Uh, for 18 years, CPAC has worked on assembling and planning for a larger, more beautiful, and functional Richard Clark Park. The principal interest we have all had in our involvement has been the preservation and development of enhanced green and open space at this unique, one-of-a-kind riverfront park. I have uh, many of the members of the Advisory Council with me today, and uh, we have some observations on the latest proposal for a boathouse in our park. Uh, we feel the boathouse complex, the footprint is too large for the park. It's uh, over two acres of building, 
including a uh, concrete uh, uh, apron uh, for something we never asked for and we never indicated a need for. Uh, it, it's located in, in the heart of the park. It dominates the parking. It blocks the river walk and displaces native gardens that we've spent uh, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of hours uh, uh, in installing. Uh, the majority of the proposed complex represents a largely narrow <coughs> singular interest for limited, uh, frankly, mostly uh, private groups. Um, the original scale of the proposed canoe kayak boathouse was something we were working with. I believe the total square footage remaining. of that was about 4,000 feet. And then suddenly we were presented with an oversized behemoth. While a beautiful design, we feel it doesn't work in our park. It's over 25,000 square feet, the building alone. Uh, it's basically a boat warehouse uh, placed on valuable green space in Clark Park. We've lobbied for years for a wet playground at Clark Park, addressing a real and vital need in this underserved area. We were told that it could not be approved you west have of Rockwell. Your two minutes. Uh, as an example, the Bloomingdale Trail had years of hearings and community input while this boathouse project was developed and uh, seemingly uh, ready for approval almost overnight. You have exceeded your two minutes. Thank you. May I continue? Or I just have about another paragraph. Can you conclude? Okay. Uh, this project we feel disrespects and disregards the years of community effort which have gone into assembling land for the park, conducting maintenance and improvement designing and promoting a comprehensive plan for the park and serving as a, as a voice for this park, which is off, was often regarded as marginal and forgotten. Our plan for the park has more or less been hijacked by other uh, interests. Decision makers have observed a seemingly vacant and unused Clark Park. They see vacant space and rush to build buildings on it while, where we see open space and an opportunity for children of the community to have open and green vistas to be preserved and cherished for future generations. We respectfully urge the Board of Commissioners not to move forward with this proposal for Clark Park, to consider moving the expanded boat warehouse elsewhere, and to begin meaningful dialogue on what the community wants and needs in Clark Park. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Or? Thank you. Mr. Barnes? Yes. Uh, commissioners, my name is Bill Barnes. I'm with the Clark Park Advisory Council. Just to augment what President Donahue has said, we have, our park is less than 15 acres, with seven of that being uh, for woods, okay, where we have our BMX park. That leaves us eight acres. Now, last month, with our last meeting, one acre of that's going to be dedicated to the new ball stadium across Rockwall. That leaves us seven acres left. I, I'm totally opposed to this new boathouse plan because it's going to take up over two and a half acres of our remaining seven acres of park. Now, we also have planned soccer fields, volleyball court, children's playground, possibly a basketball court. Um, among and native gardens and a flower garden. Where are we going to put all this in four acres, folks? I mean, <laughs> this is what I'm getting at. This, I, I believe that this project has been not thought out enough. I'm asking the board to allow us to research this with the park planners a little bit longer and to bring this as well to the community because the community has not been presented with this idea. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Lynn Dozel, George Blakemore, and Gary Oswald. Commissioners, President Traubert, Vice President. Armstrong, General Superintendent, Kelly, and Tim. My <laughs> name is Lynn Dinzel, and I am the president of something called the Chicago Rowing Foundation. 
This is a, an organization that is a 501c3 that has provided the sport of rowing since 1998 to kids in Chicago who never would have been able to access this sport. We were founded with a, with a grant from the USOC. We've grown our program. We have over 150 kids rowing now. 30% of them are on scholarship. We turn no one away because of inability to pay. We have graduated over 150 rowers in the years we've been operating. Every single one of them has gone to college. Many have received rowing scholarships to go to college. We provide the opportunity for any high school and now middle school child in Chicago to row. Over half of our rowers all the way along have been from the Chicago public high seconds schools remaining. and the Chicago public schools. Rowing is a, a, an ancient Olympic sport and we think it deserves, this city deserves to have a world-class boathouse. In fact, this was all started by the mayor and his initiative for the river, to make the river something just like the lakefront, a shoreline that Chicagoans can be proud of and find recreation on. You have exceeded it's your a, two minutes? It's a bigger initiative than just our rowing club. It, the EPA is cleaning up the river. The MWRD has agreed to clean up the river. The park district and the mayor's office you are have supporting two minutes. These, Thank you. these boat houses. And we just want you to know that we also want to make no little plans. Thank you. Maybe you can see where a women, uh, <laughs> women business owned um, organization. And these are some of our middle school rowers. All of them go to Chicago Public Middle Schools. You do have one male. No, no, I mean that. I mean us. <laughs> I just wanted them to know he oh, was yeah, acknowledged. Okay, yeah. okay. We have male rowers. <laughs> Where are you rowing from right now? We um, have the Park District to thank for, uh, we row out of a floating structure at North Avenue and the river. Mm -hmm. uh, we have no heat. We have no running water. We just got electricity the last few years. Um, it's cold when the kids come in from rowing. But we've operated out of this basically floating uh, barn since 2005. Before that, we rowed out of a site on the west side of the river where we had two shipping containers as our boathouse. Mm -hmm. And through those years, we have as I said, sent 150 rowers to college, many of them on scholarship. We've, we are nationally ranked. We are what's called a club team. We don't, we're not like St. Ignatius's team or New Trier's team, where you have to go to those schools to be on the team. We are an inclusive club team for kids in public, private, suburban Chicago schools. We've had kids, <laughs> whose first language is Spanish, Polish, Bosnian, Bulgarian, Thank you, Chinese. Hansel. So that's our program, and we hope we'll have a lovely boathouse to work out of and to provide not only for the kids we already provide for, but community learn to row programs and many other initiatives. Thank you, Ms. Denzel. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Blakemore. Good afternoon to these appointed board members, to the citizens of the city of Chicago, and to the staff. We all have something in common. We all want to have an excellent Park District. I have a vision 
of Chicago Park Board been elected directly by the voters, not appointed by the political system of the mayor or the Democratic Party. My vision is that the people will select their board members. And I think that is very important because what I've heard this morning and this afternoon when it comes to uh, minority contracts and when it comes to reporting these contracts and when it comes to the build and public building commission. So many questions that that young man, when he made his presentation, I asked him and they wasn't answered. And I, I think, well, why should I have to ask these questions? What's so special about George Blakemore? My first question was, why did he include in that report these buildings, park facilities building when it comes to remaining. when it comes to minority contracts? Why? Because the building commissioner, one thing got to be understood. Uh, Sometimes the citizens get the type of government they deserve. You have to be informed. This board, this park district, has the power to tax. And any monies that they need, they can get it directly from us, the citizen. We, this is our park district. And when it comes to certification, the park district should certify their own vendors, not look at water reclamation or the city of Chicago. This separation you have exceeded must your two minutes. occur. So I'm challenging and advocating every citizen to please get on a referendum or something and get us an elected park district board. They have them throughout the United two States minutes. Thank you. and throughout the state of Illinois. This is something inherently wrong here. So for us, we have a great park district, but my vision that it can be even greater with this separation between the political system, the city, thank you, and, Mr. and the park district. And thank you again, and thank all of you. So please remember this park district is your park district and it will cut out a, a lot of this political thing and appointment. We should be able to elect who we want to sit on the board. Thank you very much. And all of you, have a peaceful and blessed day. Mr. Oswald? And after Mr. Oswald, our last two speakers will be Jody Finn and Megan Bierner. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Mr. Schaubert, uh, President Schaubert, Commissioners, uh, Superintendent and CEO uh, Michael Kelly. Uh, I represent, as Gary, I'm Gary Oswald, I represent the South Shore Cultural Center Advisory Council and the President there. We also have one of our members uh, who's also the, corris the corresponding secretary, Sally Martini. Um, we have a wonderful facility. Uh, has a lot of things like public events and, and private events like weddings. And also we have the ongoing set of concerts. In fact, we fill out and overflow the, uh, like we did with a new work, believe it or not, um, that was held a couple of weeks ago at the South Shore Cultural Center. But we have a couple of problems too. I wanted to bring them up and they're complicated ones. Uh, we need to know, in fact, who we should talk to in the department because they're of policy issues and they're beyond, beyond our wonderful uh, uh, center staff and region and very supportive region. The incidents and changes, of, and I'll present, give this as a paper also to the board members and, and uh, the superintendent. Incidents and changes have occurred that have caused the South Shore Cultural Center Advisory Council to question whether there has been a change in the nature and importance of our partnership with the Chicago Park District. On February 27, we learned that an event that we, in partnership with the Chicago Modern Orchestra Project, had scheduled and booked for March 18th in the Paul Robeson Theater 
an event which was scheduled a year in advance had to be canceled remaining. due to sudden unscheduled work in the theater. This work is on a timetable greatly shorter than that for scheduling any major event. Subsequent events may be and are being affected, especially an upgoing concert with the Civic Orchestra of Chicago. We ask, how is major facility work at the center scheduled? How can we be assured that planners are aware of how work affects programs and schedule? With a, large state two minutes. with a large state grant apparently confirmed in the CPD five-year plan, is, it scheduled, is a steady stream of work expected that could affect scheduling and partnerships? What is the scope and, and time frame of, this, uh, of uh, the work? And uh, Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Can our recommendations and priorities to the work be uh, given consideration? I ask your indulgence, just two more paragraphs. In addition, no, and, and I'm happy to listen to them, but it's it, I, in the interest of trying to help you, it seems like these are things that, that, that are staff issues. Yes. That we ought to be able to answer the question on, on a staff level. Right. Um, so, Mike, Pat, can you? Pat can absolutely answer your, your questions, Gary. Um, and I'm going to be out there tomorrow. So okay. I'm going to take a look as well. We do have an, uh, another issue, too, with a different kind of policy question. Uh, perhaps I can, can talk to you, to you later about what that is with regard to fundraising events for the facility itself. But we certainly do want to do everything possible to continue, continue our proud and valued partnership with the Park District and for the, whole, for the whole city and the South Side. Okay. Thank you. Can I give you these? Uh, yeah, please. Okay. Thank you. All right. Ms. Ten? I'm sorry, Ms. Ten. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Superintendent Kelly, and others. My name is Jody Tin. I'm the president of the newly formed McFetridge Park Advisory Council. My colleagues and I, a couple of which are here today, represent the hundreds of figure skaters, hockey players, and tennis players that use McFetridge rink and tennis courts daily and, as you know, year-round. First, we want to say thank you for initiating an ice rink renovation and energy efficiency retrofit that's slated for McFetridge this summer. Karen Mushin and I were able to be at the committee meeting this morning, and it's clear to us that you guys know how sorely this is needed and how long overdue the project is. Thank you. Uh, this project is not only important because it's energy efficiency and cost savings perspective, but the renovation work will be immediately felt by all those that use it. As a newly formed Park Advisory Council, we're really excited to continue the partnership that we began with the Park District this fall. We've had some great meetings and conversations with Matt Marino and other Park District staff members, including our outgoing Area 4 Manager, Colleen Gall Gallagher, excuse me, and our incoming Area Manager, Maya Solis. Uh, about ways that we can improve the facility and programming offered at McFetridge. And we're looking forward to strengthening our partnership with the Park District and working together to make Chicago's only indoor ice rink and tennis courts even better. As evidenced by the oversubscribed programs, number of kids turned away each session and number of kids driving out to the suburbs to skate each week, only one indoor ice rink in a city our size no longer meets the demands. Furthermore, our city of Chicago hockey and synchronized skating teams, comprised of lots of talented and dedicated athletes, are constantly and consistently competing against teams that have three, four, and sometimes five times the ice time to practice. They're participating for national competitions representing our fair city and often feel like they're skating with uh, one hand tied behind their back, or should I say one skate behind, tied behind their back. The only thing that can improve the odds for these kids is more ice time. In the longer term, McFetridge needs a second full-size indoor skating Three rink. Seconds remaining. And it's our goal to work with you guys to make this happen. Luckily, it seems that the land is available adjacent to the current rink. Furthermore, we would like you to consider some uh, expansions in the scope of work for this summer's project, including some items that we've got on a list in front of you. Um, while McFetridge is closed for four months this summer, it's an opportune time to complete some additional improvements that will benefit McFetridge tremendously and are not extremely costly. And it does appear that, uh, speaking with Ellen, some of our ideas are already incorporated. Um, in closing, the time is right to realize a grand vision for McFetridge. We are able and willing and at the ready to work with you, and we feel like we can accomplish a lot working together, and the kids Thank of you, Chicago deserve this. Thank you.
Ms. Bierner. Hi, commissioners and superintendent and everyone. Um, I'm Megan Bierner from Chicago Outdoor Sports Association, COSA, and we represent the interests of Chicagoans and outdoor sports activities and are a voice for wellness and health and those participating in outdoor activities in, in the parks. And I'm speaking on the behalf of many citizens from many different wards who um, have expressed concern about the uh, redevelopment of North Grant Park. Um, and we appreciate um, the forum to be able to present this, and we understand that it's been given to the, um, presented to the community before, it is just now that more people from the community are coming to understand that the new park development plans for North Grant Park are not congruent with all the interests of communities that are currently using it. Um, and we'd like to see redesign in the park that includes more multi-use ice surfaces including figure for figure skating, for family skating, kids learning to skate, and for pond hockey. I think you can hear from, from Jody's presentation as you understand there's more need for ice, more ice in the city, um, not less. And um, we're currently organizing all these uh, above mentioned communities, including the rock climbing community and the tennis community, so we can have a, uh, a dialogue with the park district. Um, we are also actively working um, with financial partners and, and sponsors for the redesign of the park, incorporating more activities for ice usage. Remaining. Uh, we'd like a direct constructive dialogue with uh, the park district and, and work along with you. And uh, I think you would be very surprised and, and thrilled to see the partners that we are, are bringing in with us. Thank you. Uh, I, I, Pat might be in the back. Is Pat LaVar here or is Gia? Okay. Um, Matt Marino. I was, I was, Pat's the COO. Gia is our director of strategy and policy and also a former uh, hockey player. But certainly Matt, since everybody else is occupied, Matt, Matt would be the person, the next person to have a dialogue with. Terrific. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. There are no more speakers. Uh, next on the agenda is a report from the Committee on Administration, Vice President Armstrong. Uh, the Committee on the Administration met on March 14th. Uh, 2012 to consider matters referred from February 9th to March 14th, 2012, and hereby recommends that it that its report be adopted. Item number one, authorization to enter into a contract for the implementation of enterprise content management. Item number two, authorization to enter into an agreement for Microsoft license purchase and maintenance. Item number three, authorization to advertise green janitorial, janitorial supplies as a target market solicitation. Item number four, authority to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Chicago to accept the transfer of various funds for park projects. That concludes the report of the committee on the administration and I move for its adoption. Second. Uh, Secretary, take a roll call. Commissioner Shalaby? Aye. Commissioner Hanlon? Aye. Commissioner Lavelle? Aye. Commissioner Salgado? Aye. Vice President Armstrong? Aye. President Robert? Aye. Motion carried and the min um, excuse me, motion carried and the item is adopted. Uh, next on the agenda is the report from the Committee on Capital Improvements, Commissioner Salgado. The Committee on Capital Improvements met on March 14, 2012 to consider matters referred from February 9th to March 14th, 2012 and hereby recommends that its report be adopted. Item number one, authorization to enter into a contract for Stanton, Stanton Edwin M. Park Field House Exterior Renovation. Item number two, project approval under the Energy Savings Contracting Services Program for California Park McFetridge Sports Center, Task Order 3. Item number three, authorization to issue final payment for work completed in connection with Palmer Park. Item number four, authorization to issue final payment for work completed in connection with Nash, uh, Don Nash Community Center. Item number five, authority to enter into contracts for pre-qualified boathouse construction pool. Item number six, authorization to enter into a professional services agreement for design and engineering services for the Bloomington, Bloomingdale Park and Trail. That concludes the report of the Committee on Capital Improvements and I move for its adoption. Second. 
Uh, if no objection, we'll apply the last favorable roll call vote from the prior matter to this matter. Motion carried, and the report is adopted. Under unfinished business, nothing was pre presented for consideration. Under new business, nothing was presented for consideration. That concludes the board meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, motion carried. The board meeting is now adjourned.